Hi everyone, I'm Jack from Emling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts on the Crito. This is a dialogue of Plato's. I have it anthologized in the last days of Socrates and it's frequently grouped with the Apologia and the Phaedo because it takes place between them. Uh, the Apology had been the great trial of Socrates. Here in the Crito, we have him the day before uh, he'll die. And then in the Phaedo, we have his final hours and his actual death. And so the Credo occupies this crucial setting, but as a dialogue, it seems to be less crucial. It lacks an elaborate elenchus. There is not the classical question and answer cycle that Socrates engages an interlocutor with that leads to that person uh, discovering some new truth contrary to what he espoused at the beginning of the dialogue. Uh, there also is not the, the the elaborate rhetorical flourishes that we see in something like the Timaeus or even in the Phaedo that show uh, Socrates can really develop interesting systems and, and, and perhaps Plato is developing these systems through the mouthpiece of Socrates. Uh, but it is a crucial dialogue. It's important because of the way that I think it really reinforces aspects of the Apologia and gives those aspects of, of Plato's Socrates more weight leading into the Phaedo and, and the ideas he'll espouse in that dialogue. But I think it's also crucial in terms of the irony. The Socrates that we can sort of glean through the pages of, of early dialogues versus the, the Socrates who becomes very much Plato's Socrates later on. Uh, the, the, the Socrates that we see is a man who delights in irony. Uh, and Plato, I think, had those ironies as well, but Socrates seems to have uh, peered through and, and glimpsed a darker irony, perhaps, than many of his peers had. And I think in the Crito, we have one of the darkest ironies of, of all of Plato's corpus and certainly of, of Socrates' life. Uh, it's also crucial, I think, because of the way that it leads to ideas in later ideas around justice and government and societies and social laws. And so I, I want to talk about all of those. Uh, but very briefly, as a summary, this is the day before Socrates is going to die. It's been a couple of weeks since he was condemned in his trial and vote, it was voted that he would um, be executed, judicially murdered. So Socrates is, is sitting here and his friend Crito comes and he says, listen, the, the, the boat's going to arrive tomorrow, probably. And Socrates says, I had a dream. It might be the day after tomorrow, but Credo notes that the boat's coming. If we're going to have you escape, you know, friends and I have money, you need to escape. We need to do it now. We can bribe, you'll be fine, we'll all be fine. You have to go. And Socrates says, I'm not going. Credo then says, but listen, you have to go because everybody's gonna think that we just, people who don't know us and just hear about this are gonna think that all your friends abandoned you and that all of us were, were too cheap in a sense and greedy for our own money and our own you know wealth and, and, and position to allow you to escape. And, and you're important, you're actually important, we need you to escape. Uh, Socrates then goes, well, Credo, let's talk about that. And that's, that's then Credo's main thrust is, Everybody's going to think we're lousy friends. Uh, you're important. You need to escape. This is an unjust, you know, condemnation. This is not fair to you. You should escape. And Socrates goes, okay, well, we're going to need to like dig into this idea. And he has some questions. He goes, uh, he, he notes in one of his great ironies, though not the darkest one. He goes, I only wish that ordinary people had an unlimited capacity for doing harm. That would mean they had an unlimited power for doing good, which would be a splendid thing. In actual fact, they have neither. They cannot make a man wise or foolish. They achieve whatever luck would have it. Uh, and that is uh, a critical statement there that Plato is noting here, and Socrates is noting, the limitations on human power and human influence. Uh, that none of these individuals who condemn Socrates actually are going to have control over his final days. And he's going to refuse to allow them to have control over his final days. Um, it's, it's a signpost for what he'll, he'll say later on, uh, but it's also this important reality. Uh, it's one of the few times where Socrates really steps forward and notes that there are deep limitations on power. In, in the most unambiguous terms, there are deep limitations, and it's not just the limitation of the, the knowledge that we cannot possess or that we're constantly pushing our way towards, but it's also the actual brute force and power that we think of is not as, as formidable as so many of us fear. He then goes on to ask, well, well Credo, is it really important what other people think? Uh, he goes, I should like to consider whether we agree on this point. The really important thing is not to live, but to live well. And Credo, I agree. And is it still agreed or not 
that to live well amounts to the same thing as to live honorably and justly. And they're able to dismiss this idea that we don't, Socrates, very quickly. Uh, that the reason there's not an elaborate elenchus is because Credo's argument is not that strong. Socrates doesn't need to spend a lot of time demolishing it. He's not interested in arguing with Crito about, you know, hey, don't worry about what other people would think. He can just say that pretty quickly. Uh, and he's more interested about, okay, what's important is not what other people think. It's about how I live and how you live, Crito. It's about uh, what that means to live well. And they dig into that idea. And then later on, he goes... Uh, this fabulous moment where once he gets Credo to re recognize that it's not super important what our peers think. It's not going to be important what people later on are going to say about you or about me. Uh, that Their opinion is not particularly relevant, Credo. And he goes, we need to understand what it means to live well. And what, what, you know, we wouldn't want to harm the parts of our bodies that don't matter. Much less would we want to harm the parts of our bodies and our, our soul. He doesn't quite get to that concept, but the, the, the parts of our individuality that really do matter. And that will be an idea that he'll elaborate on later on in the Phaedo. Uh, but he brings in then an important sort of personification. And Socrates would do this in other dialogues. But here he brings on this really important personification where he brings in the laws of Athens. The, this personification of the laws... <laughs> Again, crucial to a later dialogue. Uh, and he, he asks the laws to now engage in this fictional question and answer with Socrates himself. And he's playing now both roles in this. And it's important to see that, that Socrates allows himself to abstract out the laws, uh, a very platonic idea that we can abstract out the, this, this form of law and society and, and now engage in a discussion with that because that's going to let us get to some closer truth and the laws and socrates engage in this conversation around wait a second you were born here you were raised here you chose to stay here you you know grew up here you chose to stay and have children here and raise your raise your children under these laws you have engaged in a contract with these laws you are under the authority of the laws so if you do harm to the laws you violate everything within the society that has done so much for you, Socrates. And one passage goes that you are breaking covenants and undertakings made with us, although you made them under no compulsion or misunderstanding and were not compelled to decide in a limited time. You had 70 years in which you could have left the country if you were not satisfied with us or felt that the arguments were unjust. You did not choose Sparta or Crete, your favorite models of good government, or any other Greek or foreign state. You could not have absented yourself from the city less if you had been lame or blind or decrepit in some way. It is quite obvious that you outstrip all other Athenians in your satisfaction with the city and for us its laws. For who could be pleased with a city without its laws? And now after all this, are you not going to stand by your agreement? Yes, you are, Socrates, if you will take our advice. And then you will at least escape being laughed at for leaving the city. Uh, and, and there we see that, that even when Socrates or Plato have disagreed with what uh, at, at the constitution or the, the government that Athens has set up and the form of government that Athens possesses, Socrates has stayed. He has found this to be a place where he's made his home and he finds himself, himself under the obligation to this society and to these laws. Uh, and there, therein lies this crucial, crucial irony um, that Socrates is now going to hint at and then be very, very transparent about. That Socrates has constantly made clear that he, you know, values uh, justice, he values virtue. If he here at the last hour in his final act escapes and repudiates justice, repudiates the laws and flees, what life is he fleeing to? And what has he done to demolish the work he was doing? What has he done to demolish the, the, the arguments and the, the teaching that he was engaging in with this idea of valuing virtue above all the other different types of craftsmanship or bravery or artistic value uh, and that it was virtue that was critical and crucial beyond all else. He will have abandoned all of that. He will have betrayed everything he stood for. And so he has no choice but to remain, despite the fact that this condemnation is itself unjust. And, and Socrates never notes that the, his condemnation is just. He notes that the laws are just. And, and there is going to be this irony that's going to pop out. 
But uh, he goes on to describe what a wonderful life he would have now that he's in his 70s uh, and is a very old man who probably does not have much longer to live anyways. That if he flees, he will get to go uh, teach in Thessaly, uh, which is, you know, a completely different culture. One that will not, that, that he does not feel he could have ever gone to and, and had these discussions with the individuals from that culture. It, it would, would be ridiculous. And he would now become this, this almost like court jester and this icon of ridicule. Uh, when we followed up with the fact that over the past century, there had been various disgraced Greeks who had gone to the great enemy Persians and counseled them or advised them, people who had been exiled from Athens during the Peloponnesian War and had gone and supported their enemies in, in Sparta or in the Peloponnesian War, that uh, Socrates is acutely aware of how all of these individuals are perceived. All of their previous work is completely erased. They are remembered as traitors or as fools. And that's how he will be remembered if he chooses to escape here at the last hour. Um, and he notes, as it is, you will leave this place when you do as the victim of a wrong done not by us, the laws, but by your fellow men. But if you leave in that dishonorable way, returning injustice for injustice and injury for injury, breaking your agreements and covenants with us and injuring those whom you least ought to injure yourself, your friends, your country and us, then you will have to face our anger while you live. And in that place beyond, when our brothers, the laws of Hades, know that you have done your best to destroy even us, they will not take you with a kindly welcome. And there is this irony now that um, it is not the laws that are unjust. It is the implementation of the laws by imperfect people that is unjust. Socrates at no point has said that this, my death is, is what should happen. It is, is just. It is my condemnation was fair. He notes he did not. He stands firm just as he did in the Apologia. He does not apologize. He does not suggest that this is a, totally fine and okay. And you know, oh gosh, of course, he he will hold on and say that he has been right the entire time, that virtue was crucial, that he was not corrupting the youth. But if he leaves, every accusation that was made against him now gets a new life, a new voice. Everything about the unjust trial suddenly is proven by his conduct. And he knows this. He knows that this horrifying irony at the end for Socrates is that despite the injustice of his condemnation, should he leave, every charge made against him is now proven true in a court of public opinion. And I think this was something that was very hard for Plato to accept. Plato was able to travel. He traveled to, to different places. He counseled uh, leaders in different places. He, he you know, lived a very different life from Socrates. Uh, and I think there's an aspect of that, that that became harder and harder for Plato to understand was how had he made these efforts and then found a lot, the same lack of success that Socrates did. Uh, but what did it mean for his mentor and, and this person he respected above all else to have stood firm at the end and to have died uh, and been executed despite the, the injustice of it? And he, he, he really, I think, struggled with that. So despite this being an earlier dialogue, I think it points towards later developments, later struggles that Plato would have within his own life, within his own philosophy. Um, I think it's also crucial in terms of Socrates having reinforced this idea that it was virtue, I die a just person, and that is, is, is the greater good, uh, allows him to now have the deep flourishes of the Phaedo, where he has this defense of the soul, this defense of immortality, this idea that his reward in the afterlife is going to fairly closely parallel the reward he suggested for himself in the Apologia. But that's another video. Uh, so I think this is a great dialogue. It's short. It, uh, I think, reveals this other side of Socrates, this human side that's also aspirational and, and, and pushing it into this argument with the laws that is really quite interesting. Um, there were dark, dark ironies, though, within Plato and Socrates. I think one of the darkest, close with this one, is in Lachis, where he has Nicias as one of the um, argumentative opponents discussing bravery knowing that Nicias would later be one of the generals in the Sicilian expedition uh, for Athens during the Peloponnesian War and would be executed, horrifyingly. Um, here we have an earlier Nicias arguing with Socrates about bravery and, and, and those concepts. Uh, certainly within the dialogues of Plato, we have 
the laws. <laughs> this was something that I think Plato had, had been on Plato's mind quite a bit. It's interesting to, to wonder, I, uh, I do wonder if the actual Socrates came up with this idea of arguing with the laws as this personification, uh, or if perhaps he had done it, but not in this specific setting with Crito. Uh, and that Plato sort of uses that idea, and, and we sort of see Plato working towards what he's going to develop on his own. Uh, certainly another great um, uh, dialogue to pair with this would be the Republic, where Plato is going into ideas around a model of government um, and noting how different it is from the laws of Athens. As I had mentioned, this, I think, dialogue is, is one of the early points where we see an idea of an individual being under the authority of the society he or she is part of, uh, something that Rousseau would certainly develop in the social contract at great length. And finally, it was interesting to see the way that um, Socrates argues with the use of tradition and authority um, and, and, and the obligation one owes towards a society uh, and think about that in comparison to the Analects of Confucius or even the development from Mencius um, of Confucian thought. Uh, and sort of its application in, in life and in governance. So let me know your thoughts and I'll see you around. Thanks.